I'm Richard Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. As I had been even nearly four decades ago, when the program on race relations in crisis that follows today was first broadcast. Malcolm X was my guest that fateful day in June 1963. So were the two black leaders who in 1992 had survived nearly 30 years more of racial concerns and who joined me then for another special edition of The Open Mind designed both to look back and to look ahead at race relations in America. It follows as well. Of course, when Malcolm and the others first explored the subject with me, it was still weeks before the massive 1963 March on Washington and Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. But already what has been called two lines of dissent, two temperaments, two potentials, contended for the spirit of black Americans. A tension between the children of Martin and the children of Malcolm. A tension so evident in our exchanges the day I pre-recorded the program we are about to see. Wednesday, June 12th, 1963. Earlier that morning, Medgar Evers was assassinated, shot in the back by a bullet from a high-powered rifle. Field Secretary for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in Jackson, Mississippi, Evers had long lived on the very edge of racial violence. At 14, his own father's good friend had been lynched for allegedly insulting a white woman. He had himself been beaten over the head with a revolver by a policeman. His life had repeatedly been threatened. And 10 days earlier, he had said, if I die, it will be in a good cause. I've been fighting for America as much as the soldiers in Vietnam. Eight hours before I recorded our program, Medgar Evers did die of the assassin's bullet. With most of the thousands of racially motivated murders of blacks since the Civil War, so many of them lynchings, the killer or killers went unpunished. Ever's killer wasn't convicted and sentenced until 31 years after his foul deed. The day before, however, had also been historic. National Guard troops, federalized by the president for the purpose, had forced Governor George C. Wallace and his state troopers to step aside and for the first time permit qualified blacks to enroll in the University of Alabama. There was no violence. And that night, in a dramatic and emotion-laden nationwide television address, John F. Kennedy appealed for the first time to what Lincoln had called the better angels of our nature, to help set right the relationship of white to black Americans. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue, pled the young president who would himself be struck down before the year was over. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? Hours later, Medgar Evers was assassinated. Still later that day, Malcolm X and my other guests joined me to record the program we are about to revisit. First, however, a caveat, a personal one. Be forgiving, please, for the incredible foolishness of a young host literally smoking up a storm. This segment of our program is being pre-recorded on the morning of Wednesday, June the 12th. Now, I give you this bit of seemingly gratuitous information only because the fastest moving area of American life today is the struggle for equality between all Americans. And what is thought and said today may easily be modified by the events of tomorrow. In Ebony Magazine for July 1963, Lerone Bennett Jr. writes about the mood of the Negro in this way. 
The mood speaks in angry eyes and anguished hearts. It says now. It says all. It says enough. The words, the angry eyes, and the heavy hearts are reflections of a vast and potentially explosive emotional upheaval in the ghettos of America. The upheaval expresses itself on one level in a growing mood of defiance and despair, in go-for-broke demonstrations in Mississippi and Alabama, and spasmodic protests in the North. On another level, the upheaval takes the form of massive disaffection and a growing mood for blackness. However expressed, the mood and its manifestations are moving Negro Americans to a fateful eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball confrontation with Jim Crow. Now, the quest for equality is a human, not a racial problem. It is the white man's problem as much as it is the Negro's. At this moment in time and space, however, it seemed appropriate to bring together a few of those Negroes who have approached the theme of equality from a variety of experiences and points of view. Let me then introduce my guests. First, Wyatt T. Walker, Chief of Staff of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Executive Assistant to the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Alan Morrison, New York Editor of Ebony Magazine. Malcolm X, Minister of Mosque Number no. 7 here in New York City, a leader in the Black Muslim Organization. And James Farmer, National Director of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Mr. Farmer, I think I would begin the program by putting a first question to you, referring back to this Ebony Magazine story that quotes you as saying that Negroes are fed up. You say they are, quote, not afraid to go to jail now. They wear jail sentences as badges of honor, not even being afraid of being shot. These people aren't going to stop. And I wonder, Mr. Farmer, how you would conclude that. Aren't going to stop until what? We aren't going to stop until a black skin is no longer considered a badge of deformity by the American people. We are not going to stop until the dogs stop biting little children in Alabama, until the rats in tenement slums in Harlem and a hundred Harlems throughout the country stop biting our people. We are not going to stop until the bigots of the South and the North no longer challenge a man's right to live simply because he is asking for the rights which the Constitution says are his, as happened to NAACP Field Secretary Medgar Evers, who was shot and killed in Jackson, Mississippi. We are not going to stop in a word until we have the same rights that all our Americans have. We are not going to stop until we have jobs and are not walking the street unemployed in a proportion which is more than two times as great as among whites. We are not going to stop until we have the right to a house, a decent home, an apartment, any place we choose to live. We are not going to stop until we have the right to enter any place which serves the public all over the country. We are not going to stop in a word until America becomes America for all people. What would your assumption be about the time when, as you say, America becomes America for all people? Things are moving very rapidly now, and I think they're moving to a climax. This is a climactic stage of the struggle. And I would expect that within two or three years, the most brutal aspects of segregation in the South, that is, formal segregation, will be eliminated. Segregation in businesses that serve the public. I would expect, however, that there will be exceptions, that in the hardcore states of the Deep South, such as Mississippi and Alabama, and the hardcore areas of the Upper and Middle South, it will take a few years longer for us to break down those barriers. I would expect that it will take several years longer in the North for us to wipe out the more subtle forms of discrimination in housing, in employment, in de facto school segregation, and of police brutality. I think, however, that within five or ten years at the most, I'll be able to take a vacation and go fishing. Uh, how do you gentlemen feel about Mr. Farmer's timetable? Mr. Walker? Well, I would agree uh, with Jim wholeheartedly that uh, the revolution now has been mounted. What we've seen in the last four or five years has been perhaps the rumbling and thundering of a revolution that had only established beachheads. And I think this is <clears throat> the critical significance of Birmingham, Alabama, that here the movement for Negro, the Negro's full emancipation took a significant turn. And I think the mood of the Negro around the country has been well, knowing the frame of reference in which Birmingham has existed, 
Uh, if Negroes can stand up like this in Birmingham, Alabama, then what the hell, we, can, we ought to do something here. And I think it has given a new sense of militancy and a new sense of direction to the entire Negro community in America. What do you think was the ingredient here that led to this attitude? And Mr. Farmer said a moment ago, this is a particularly crucial period. We're all aware of that. What has changed now? What has changed in this year and in last? Well, uh, I think the mounting of the revolution, in, in other words, there has been the contagion of heroism. I think the human spirit uh, admires uh, heroism and courage. And in an instance like Birmingham, they have seen this demonstrated by the young and the old alike, male and female. And it has an infectious quality. And the compounded frustration of 244 years of slavery and the last 100 years of quasi-freedom with uh, all of the geometric frustration that the Negro has had. Uh, I think this is a part of what Dr. King describes as a zeitgeist. It just had to come, and this is the moment. Malcolm X? Well, as a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and a Muslim, we believe that Mr. Muhammad has been raised by God to separate the so-called Negroes in this country from our former slave master and to uh, lead us to a land of our own where we can stand on our own feet and solve our own problems. And because we uh, religiously believe that uh, it is intended, it is, a, it is part of God's plan to separate the former slave, so-called Negro, from the former slave master, the American white man, we also believe that uh, every effort to force integration uh, upon the white man or to force the so-called Negro into the white society is actually in direct and divine opposition to God and will, re and will meet with uh, bloodshed and destruction and no progress or benefit either to the so-called Negro or to the white man in this country. Mr. Morrison? Well, I agree with Reverend Wyatt Walker when he says that the revolution which uh, is, is now going on in America uh, against uh, second-class citizenship and against uh, uh, racial oppression uh, had to come. Uh, I, I don't altogether uh, uh, concur with uh, Re Reverend King's analysis, which I think uh, is well-intentioned, but founded in, a, in his mystical philosophy that uh, this is a zeitgeist period. I think the revolution was was uh, the result of inevitable historical forces, uh, and we must recognize uh, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued that uh, that uh, chattel slavery was succeeded by racial segregation, and that as chattel slavery uh, had to be overwhelmed and destroyed uh, by a military conflict and by force. Uh, and it may be necessary, as we are seeing today, that racial segregation has to be confronted in a similar manner and that the, the force and might of the state uh, has to be exerted in uh, uprooting uh, inequality from our society and in destroying a racial segregation, which is simply the successor to chattel slavery. Uh, the revolution, uh, and I am very uh, glad to note that that word uh, uh, has reached a new significance and a respectability uh, in our culture and language, uh, embraces all classes uh, of the Negro population, from the young to the old. They are uh, united in a determination which has reached uh, a zenith, a new point in fervor, that they will not suffer indignities further and that they are prepared to die. Negroes are prepared to pay the price of violence uh, in their struggle for equality, as a noted Negro educator stated this week outside of the United States, I may note. But there it is. The confrontation is here, and we must face it and all of its consequences. And that uh, we, we must also be prepared uh, to realize that the struggle may take other than nonviolent means. Now, this does not mean that the Negro is by nature violent. The Negro wants his rights, 
and I, the Negro American, will achieve his rights. But it may be necessary uh, to defend uh, his, uh, his birthright, to defend his heritage, and to maintain his status and to go forward to the goals that he has set for himself to protect uh, his life, to protect his family, and to protect his status as a citizen. Violence is upon us, and we, we must face it. And I think that uh, there is great alarm in the land, in high places as well as low. And I think it is reflected in, the, in President Kennedy's great concern about what he calls moving the Negroes' demand for equality from the streets into the courts. It's been in the courts for a long time, and the Negro became impatient. He became impatient and demonstrated in the streets. Now, the power structure of this country wants to contain the struggle. Where it, from, where it will go from here, we now have to consider. What do you mean the power structure wants to contain the struggle? I mean that uh, those interests uh, who own, uh, who run, who rule uh, the economy and the political structure of this country are now uh, terribly alarmed that the Negroes' upsurge uh, for equal rights and for the abolition of, uh, of the badge uh, uh, of color, uh, which uh, Mr. Farmer referred to just a minute ago, uh, may, may result in a grave destruction of the uh, status of the United States and its economy. It could result in, in serious damage to the uh, image of the United States abroad. Uh, a very, a very interesting statement was made characterizing this threat. Uh, an organization was formed just a week ago uh, by uh, Negro intellectuals and a couple of political people. And the man who formed it said, uh, it is now easier and it will become far more uh, simpler to persuade uh, and prevail upon uh, the legislators in Congress to pass civil rights legislation because the danger, the menace to the system here, to American society, is great and serious. And he put it this way. The white man is afraid that the Negro is going to tear up the pea patch of America. Tom? Well, I too think that uh, <clears throat> the Negro's revolutionary struggle is a part of a historical process. We see a worldwide struggle for freedom and Negroes could not escape becoming a part of that. This struggle is going on in Africa, in Asia, it's going on all over the world. And certainly the Negro American was bound to come to the point where he asked, what about this American faith and what about these tenets of democracy? Don't they apply to me? And if not now, when? I think that in historical terms we can date the new militancy of the Negro back to World War II when uh, Negro boys in uniform were fighting against the master race theory of Hitlerism. Of course, they were bound to ask themselves, um, what about the master race theory back in Alabama and Mississippi? Shouldn't I fight against that just as hard? I think another reason for the evolving militancy is the increasing education of Negro youth. As one of the Negro sit-in leaders uh, replied when he was asked uh, back in 1960, what accounted for the difference between his father and himself? He said, well, Pop had only the Bible. I've got the Bible and the college education. How are you going to teach a man about the tenets of American democracy without expecting that at some point he will ask, don't these things mean me, if not now, when? A third factor that has created the new revolution uh, is, of course, the emerging nations of Africa. Negroes have gotten a greater sense of identity and identification and a greater sense of pride as a result of it. Uh, you can only push a man around so long and this has encouraged Negroes to demand that the pushing around stop. Now then there have come the sit-ins, the freedom rides, before that Montgomery, the bus boycott under Dr. King's leadership, now Birmingham. So it's like a miasma now, north and south. Negroes are saying not tomorrow, not next week, but now. Well, of course, what I'd like to do is get back uh, in just a moment after we take a break to the questions that you gentlemen have raised, particularly the one that Mr. Morrison raises about this, this effort of the power structure in this country 
as you say, to contain the struggle that uh, you are discussing, Mr. Farmer. But let's just take a break and we'll be back to that subject in a moment. Mr. Farmer, let's go back to this matter that Mr. Morrison raised about the power structure in this country wanting to contain, and I presume that means restrain, the struggle for equality of the Negro. How do you react to that notion? Well, I think the power structure in the United States is no different from any other power structure, and power structures always uh, try to protect their position and try to uh, uh, avoid trouble. They don't want trouble. They want to contain it as much as possible. To illustrate that, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, after massive demonstrations and after 1,500 arrests, we were asked to stop, just stop. Of course, we refused to do that, and they finally offered us um, two theaters desegregated if we would agree not to demonstrate against anything else. And presumably this meant till the end of time. Well, needless to say, we could not accept that, because what we're asking for now is complete desegregation of everything. We're asking for an open city. Our power structures always have to be prodded. And I think that if we continue to prod the power structure of the United States, as we're doing it now with marching feet and by sitting in with a demand for freedom, such as a picket line that is going on up in Harlem now, uh, protesting unemployment and discrimination in the building trades, we will continue to prod the power structure so that the economic part of the power structure will realize that the choice is be between um, granting the demands, the legitimate demands of Negroes, or going out of business. Yes, but when you talk about power structure, I think now the national government, and I think of President Kennedy's speech on, on Tuesday night, uh, I think of uh, more than a locality, more than the particular economic interests involved. And I wonder whether you gentlemen feel that basically the American power structure in all of its uh, ramifications and implications seeks to contain a restraint. Well, before this Minister Malcolm takes off on this, let me uh, make another comment Go with ahead. regard to the administration. The administration's position in the past three years has been to try to contain it, to stop the trouble. In the Freedom Ride, we were asked to stop and cool off. This has been the response of the administration at all times, but now as there is growing momentum uh, to the revolution, the administration is being pulled along. And I hope they'll be pulled along enough so that they'll take the lead and actually do something constructive. Well, let me, uh, Malcolm X, if I may, let me pursue this just a moment, Mr. Farmer. When you talk about the administration, when you talk about containment, are you talking about containing the, the acts of violence or near violence, or are you talking about containing the Negro's effort to secure for himself the equality that is the birthright of all people? We're talking about containing the militant struggle. Stop what you are doing, and let's go back to the old way of doing it, by sitting around the table and uh, parceling out um, a few minor steps here and there. But this is not enough any longer. But do you think that this reflects a basic uh, refusal, refusal to accept the development of the Negro's position? Well, I think in part it's a refusal or a failure to uh, recognize the intensity of the demands. Now, I think that that recognition is coming. I think that the administration is beginning to recognize it. The speech of the president recently on civil rights indicates that. But this is because the pressure is kept up. And I fear that if the pressure uh, relaxes now, that the tendency of the power structure to move will decline. That's why we intend to keep up the pressure, as I'm sure the other gentlemen here do. Malcolm I think, X, I, I, think, I think perhaps we ought to turn to Malcolm X, who wanted to comment on that. Yes, on this uh, white power structure. When you say power structure, I know you mean the white power structure, because that's all we have in America. And the white power structure today is just as much uh, interested in perpetuating slavery as the white power structure was a hundred years ago. Only now they use modern methods of doing so and uh, realizing that the black people in this country are waking up and becoming filled with a desire to be uh, looked upon as men and as human beings, the white power structure to slow down that uh, struggle for freedom and human dignity uh, uses tricks. A uh, hundred years ago they could do it with chains. Today they, they use tricks and one of the tricks that they've invented is, is this token integration to give the get Negro, so-called Negro leaders to accept the few token crumbs of integration that don't solve any problem for the masses of black people in this country whatsoever, but it does make the hand-picked Negroes uh, be satisfied to slow down the cry of the masses. And a good example of that is as soon as the uh, spirit of rebellion or, or revolution 
began to spread among the masses of black people in this country, and they began to take an active part, and they showed that they weren't uh, confined to this uh, nonviolent approach, then the government or the power structure uh, began to sit up and take notice, and uh, uh, now, as, the, as you said earlier, the president is talking about new legislation and uh, to put it, uh, take it out of the streets and put it back in the courts. Why, as long as it's in the streets, it's in the hands of the masses of black people who will not compromise or who cannot be bought out. But when you put it back in the courts, then that puts it back into the hands of the uh, hand-picked Negro leaders who will uh, allow the judges and the uh, 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 other persons that are, in, that are involved in this white power structure to slow them down. It's only a trick. And as long as the masses of black people are involved in the struggle for freedom, not integration, but freedom, the respect uh, as human beings, respect as men, and show that they're willing to die to be respected as men, then the power structure sits up and takes notice. But as long as this mass element is uh, led, and when I say led, I, I use led in quotes, actually contained uh, by Uncle Tom Negro leaders who hold them back, who tell them turn the other cheek, and things like that, then the white power structure isn't worried at all. They're only worried when they know that the masses of black people are ready to explode, and in exploding it will destroy some of the furniture in their house. Uh, and then they react according, accordingly. Mr. Morris? Well, I believe that the dominant interests in our society, uh, which are white, of course, are extremely worried uh, that, their, uh, that their system will be uh, seriously damaged. It is disrupted now, and they want to halt the, disrupt the, the disruption which is being caused by the rising wave of militancy among Negroes all over the country. Uh, Pr President Kennedy, in commenting on uh, on the efforts and the methods being used by American Negroes to gain their their ends and their goals, uh, which simply stated are uh, 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 un uh, unrestricted uh, access to citizenship rights, um, said that it is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the uh, on the streets. But uh, the Negro started out trying to settle uh, uh, his problems and to correct his uh, his disadvantages uh, and uh, and uh, destroy the, the 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 basis for his struggle and eliminate the grievances, very serious grievances he had in the courts. Uh, our NAACP was set up on the basis of uh, of uh, of legal struggle and legal tactics alone, and it had it had it his head to revise its whole approach to the to, to the questions. And yet, and yet, Mr. Morrison, it seems to me that the president was saying that uh, while he seeks to remove the struggle from the streets, that the courts have gone quite far, that the president, presidential office, the executive branch of our government, in the president's terms, well, has, has made certain steps, and he seems to be saying more now. He says, we face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk. It is time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives, which is more than saying, let's send it back to the Why courts. didn't he say this three years ago? He, uh, why didn't he say this uh, when all of these uh, sit-ins and freedom rides were very peacefully uh, going on in the South and in other parts of the North. The man didn't say anything until he found out that black people in this country were, were ready to explode. And as soon as he saw that the explosion then was a threat to the white society, he came up, up with this mealy mouth speech, which is too late, and it's only a speech. We still don't see any, any uh, actions that have stemmed from it. It's still only in the stage of words. I think the, the speech is late, Minister Malcolm X, but not too late. No, no pronouncement that was that impressive and forthright from a president of the United States. No one made late. a better pronouncement than Abraham Lincoln made a hundred years ago, and that still hasn't been put into practice. It's I, still a pronouncement. Sir, uh -huh. I, would, I applaud words for what words are worth, and those were good and beautiful words. Now we want to see the president follow up these words with deeds, because we will judge him in the next election. We will judge the entire administration not by the beauty of the words which they uttered, nor the soundness of those words. We will judge them by what they do. Now, what can he do? 
He will propose legislation. This legislation must be forthright and powerful legislation covering the whole gamut of uh, discrimination against Negroes in housing, in employment, in schools, in public places. It must strike at the very root of segregation and prejudice. The president must do more than propose the legislation. He must get out and fight for it. He has a good chance of pushing it through now. I'd like to remind us that uh, the president, uh, in part, foreclosed the possibility of success of civil rights legislation by not fi fighting for a change in Senate Rule 22 at the beginning of this session of Congress. Now it'll be more difficult, but I think he can push it through. And I'd like to say that uh, we are not going to sit by idly if uh, we have to be spectators at uh, the same old tragic comic opera of a filibuster in the Senate of the United States. We plan to have demonstrations, nonviolent demonstrations and massive there. And I'm sure Wyatt Walker can tell you that they have similar plans. Yes, I would hardly agree with uh, Jim Farman. I can understand the impatience and frustration that uh, Malcolm X evidences. Not frustration. I want to straighten you out. Maybe impatience, but not frustration. Well, You're only frustrated when you don't get what you expect. And a, and, and a black man is out of his mind after sitting around here listening to these political speeches by politicians for a hundred years. He's out of his mind well, I, if he thinks that he's going to get anything uh, more today than he got a hundred years ago. Well, I was about to say that uh, Mr. Kennedy probably has another thing coming if he proposes legislation, and I personally don't believe that it has a prayer of passing. Uh, I hope he doesn't think that this politically will get him off of the hook. Merely to propose it and then it gets killed by a filibuster will not be enough. And as Jim Farmer has indicated, uh, CORE has some definite plans, as does the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. I don't think it can be solved uh, this summer. Uh, by proposed legislation, which is, seems to me destined for failure. Uh, I think it's got to come through some strong executive action. Uh, it may be that we'll have to see martial law declared in several areas throughout the South. You mean a military dictatorship? Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't choose to describe it as It'll uh, take a military dictatorship to bring black people and white people together in the same house. It'll take a military, if it takes, if all of the token integration, which you've seen in the South, and it's only tokenism. And if this has caused the bloodshed that it has, what do you think white people, both North and South, will do on the basis of real integration? If, uh, if you only ask for crumbs, and, you're, and the granting of those crumbs causes bloodshed, what do you think will uh, be caused when you ask for a loaf of bread or a bakery in which to bake your own bread? Well, let, me, let me continue with... Go ahead, uh, Mr. Walker the business of the power structure, which is the point I ultimately wanted to make about wanting to contain it. Uh, I agree with Mr. Morris in, uh, in point that they'd like to have the revolution developed on a schedule, but revolutions don't develop like that. And uh, I think this is what's apparent to the administration and to the whole nation. And the reason we're having such a, uh, a thrust now is because uh, America as a nation has never really grappled with uh, the problem of race and color prejudice in America. And its most grievous error was made shortly after the Emancipation Proclamation when it made a moral compromise, and we're bearing the fruits of it now. And uh, the revolution is not going to develop in an orderly and scheduled fashion. It's going to develop so fast that uh, the administration won't be able to cope with it until something is done nationwide, north, south, east, and west. I don't think there's any other course for it to take. And uh, in some moments, I think it's going to be even more swift than what uh, Jim Farmer conjectured. Uh, we may, may see the resolution, resolution of this in another year. Farmer? Yes, uh, I think what the power structure is really afraid of, more so than guns, because they can get bigger guns, they can pull up howitzers in the age of the atomic bomb and the nuclear bomb. They're not so much afraid of the guns which we may have. We don't have many guns compared with the guns which they can pull up. They are more afraid of the dollar. Uh, a. Philip Randolph has said that the only book which is universally understood in our country is the pocketbook. And he's right. What the businessmen in Greensboro were scared to death of was the fact that people were not buying. Not only black people, but white people were staying off the streets, perhaps for different reasons. I'm sure for different reasons. But they were staying off the streets downtown. Nobody was buying. And if they can't make money out of the situation, then they want to do a rethink. 
because they love the dollars more than they love discrimination and segregation. Now, we in CORE are going to use the dollar weapon more than we've ever used it before. We have set a deadline of July 4th, uh, and we are calling upon all businesses that are parts of chains, north and south, not only to stop segregating in their facilities, but also to stop discriminating in their employ. Uh, they must employ Negroes and whites in all categories by July 4th. If they do not, and if they are parts of national chains, then they will face uh, imminent boycotts, economic pressure, and mass demonstrations. Now, we're not saying that they have to complete the process of uh, creating open businesses without discrimination by July 4th, but at least there has to be a commitment for the imminent end of segregation and discrimination in their places of accommodation. It should be also said uh, to buttress what Jim has just indicated, that this is why the power structure wants to contain it, because granting to the Negro full emancipation means a readjustment of the entire economy uh, of the United States, uh, the financial economy and the political economy. Uh, once the Negro is given that, then the America has to uh, uh, change its entire posture. Uh, uh, I think it's an uh, inevitable move toward uh, some kind of socialism of a sort. Mr. Walker, are you saying, and I would like to ask you, gen the rest of you gentlemen, this question, are you saying, therefore, that you do not believe that President Kennedy and the present administration mean what it is they say? Let's forget the question of tactics or delay or sh whether this should have come three years ago or what. But are you saying, when you refer to the power structure and you're talking about a fear of something akin to socialism, a changing, a thorough changing of our economic and political structure, are you saying that this administration and all of those political leaders who have stood through the years for the fight that you are waging, are you saying that they don't mean what they say? I think it's well-intentioned, but uh, when I look at it realistically as a Negro living in the Deep South, uh, I do not see that this is sufficient to bring about what needs to be done immediately. I don't think legislation alone can do it. Uh, and I do believe that... Uh, How can you believe it's well-intentioned, then? Well, I'm charitable enough to believe it's well-intentioned. Uh, I don't think it's realistic. That's why we're still in the condition that we're in. Our, our leaders are too charitable uh, toward those politicians who have been using flowery words but not coming up with deeds that will uh, be equal to those words. Sir, well, I think the real question is not whether they mean it, but what they do about it, whether they can pull it off. Because we've heard good words for hundreds of years now, and uh, they haven't come off. Yes. Now, maybe they've meant it. I don't know. I can't look into a man's mind and read his mind. I'm not a mind reader. But what I know is that those words have not been backed up by deeds. So we will have to judge the administration. We'll have to judge its good intentions by what it does, not by what it says. But of course, it all comes back to Mr. Morrison's statement about power structure. And this is why I keep uh, not beating a dead horse, because it's hardly dead. Coming back to the question of whether you feel that basically the power structure, however one might define that in this country, is basically opposed to the Negro's search for equality. Uh, this, it seems to me, is such a basic question, and such a basic question that we ought to take a break for a moment and come back to it in just a moment. Mr. Walker, you wanted to say something about Yes, that. I want to take a strong exception to the present suggestion that it's better to move the struggle of the Negro for full emancipation out of the streets back into the courts. And I take the inference as meaning that it's dangerous for the battle to be waged in the streets. But I think uh, in the wise of our American heritage that I don't want anyone or uh, the public to think that our means of fighting for equality in the streets is an illegitimate method. It's a part of the American tradition. And I do not want it thought that uh, because it uh, is dangerous, that it should be taken from us as a methodology to secure full emancipation now. May I just say, as an historian, my reading of what the president said on Tuesday night is not that there is something wrong with what goes on in the streets, but that he himself, as an historian, knows that this is the way so much has been accomplished in our own history but rather is saying that that has been the prelude to the writing into our governmental structure, through our legislatures, through our executive branch, uh, of more fundamental reforms. I don't think that he is saying that there is something illegitimate about what happens in the street, in the actions that you gentlemen are responsible for. I don't think that at all. This is, this is my own reading of it, but rather <coughs> that he is, he is seeking now to make firmer 
within the context of this total American structure, what has been stirred up by the actions of the street. But, but when he Sorry. says it's better, uh, fortunately, or I guess unfortunately, John Candy has never been a Negro, and I can't wait to go through the courts because I've seen a hundred years of that, and uh, it's city by city and county by county and specific instance by specific instance. And that's why the courts alone will not do it, and I can't buy that it's better to move it from the streets into the courts. Uh, what this nation must face is that uh, we have a legitimate right under the First Amendment guarantees of the Bill of Rights to peacefully demonstrate, and this is what the nonviolent revolution is directed at. And uh, this is why we insist upon it. Uh, as a means of, uh, if you will, creating a crisis so severe that the government, the federal administration, has to grapple with it and do something immediately. But it seems to me that what, what President Kennedy is saying, that he is urging upon the congressional branch of government, the legislative branch of government, what it is you have just said, that the federal government must seize upon this question now that it has been dramatized but I think, so successfully by what has happened. But, but I think government. he knows full well that it cannot be done like this this summer, and we say it must be done this summer. And yet what you say is that the national government must do something. The means by which the national government does things is through the executive branch, through the Congress. The courts have acted. You say the courts do not function quickly enough. I think the president concedes that. Uh, I'm not uh, here, obviously, as moderator, and forgive me for stepping out of my role, uh, taking one position or another, but rather trying to clarify what it is that the president has said. And he is not, it seems to me, denying the validity of what happens in the streets, but rather, as you have suggested, saying this must lead now to other action and is urging upon the Congress this other action. Mr. Moderator. Let, let, let me, let, let me, 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 let Anel Ponder, one of our field secretaries, and six other uh, ladies and young girls were returning from South Georgia and in Winona, Mississippi. They went into the previously all-white uh, waiting room of a trailway bus station. And this is supposed to have been settled by legislation and ICC regulations two years ago, climaxed in the Freedom Ride. Yet they were arrested and beaten and put in jail and held in incommunicado, incommunicado, incommunicado and in need of medical treatment that they never did receive. Now, this is why the Negro mood is such that we won't buy legislation alone. There's got to be legislation that is enforced by whatever it takes to enforce it. Mr. Palmer? Sir, I hope we understand that uh, Negroes don't like being in the streets. I don't like being in the streets myself. But it's something that we have to do. I would much rather um, stay at home. I would much rather take things easy. I'll only be able to take things easy, you see, when this problem is settled. That's the way that we can get the matter out of the streets, by settling it. And the sooner we do it, the better for all of us. Until it is settled, we intend to stay in the streets, not as something we want to do, but as something we have to do. Mr. Morrison? Uh, uh, President Kennedy not only stated that, the, uh, uh, that, the, that his administration uh, considered it uh, much better uh, I would uh, also uh, assume safer uh, for the struggle uh, of the Negro population to be removed from the area of street demonstrations and protest to the courts. But he also stated, and I quote, uh, where legal remedies are not at hand, redress is sought in the streets in demonstrations, parades, and protests which create tensions and threaten violence. Well, I say that responsibility for the tensions and violence uh, li uh, lies not with the Negro people who are proceeding peacefully and legitimately for legitimate rights which the Constitution says they should have and privileges which have been denied them as citizens. But I also say that uh, in the tradition of American struggle for freedom. Uh, street demonstrations and public protests are completely consistent with American rights and with American history. We must not forget that the revolution uh, which uh, uh, created independence for this republic uh, was started in such a street demonstration on Boston Common. And a Negro played a rather significant role in that demonstration, even though uh, the Negro population of that country of, of this country at that time uh, was not a political factor uh, but was enslaved.
Well, I don't think that there's any question but that uh, anyone who knows the history of this country would concede, in fact, insist that this kind of uh, street work, street fighting, the indication by the mass of the people of their feelings has been quite consistent. And as a matter of fact, perhaps been one of the, one of the finest aspects of the American heritage, whether it was the farmers who said they better raise less corn and more hell or, or whatever group it might be. But their action led to change, led to governmental change, led to legislative change, which the president is now urging. And it just seems to me, and I, I don't want to pursue this further, but it just does seem to me that uh, the president isn't denying the validity of the action, of mass demonstration, of what has taken place on the part of, of, of your movement, Mr. Walker, your movement, uh, Mr. Farmer, but rather is saying this must now be institutionalized, which is what I should imagine you gentlemen would want. Well, you, can't, you can't con compare <clears throat> the uh, revolt of farmers with the, con with the revolt of black people in this country, because if the farmers are revolting over more or less corn, uh, which is in no way involves the Constitution or, or what this country is supposed to stand for, but the black man in this country is supposed to be uh, getting freedom. The country is supposed to be based on that. Uh, democracy, freedom, justice, equality, and all that stuff that they teach us in school. And uh, now, why should the black man have to go to court to get freedom when a white man in this country is free when he's born? Why should the black man need some legislation to prove that he's a human being when you don't need any legislation to prove that whites are human beings? So I make this point because to come right back to my initial statement at the outside of the program, you will never get real freedom and recognition between black and white people in this country without destroying the country, without destroying the present political system, without destroying the present economic system, without rewriting the entire Constitution. It will be a complete destruction of everything that America supposedly stands for before a white man in this country will recognize a black man as something on the same level with himself. And this is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that the best way to solve the problem is complete separation. Let the black man, those of our people in this country who want to, have a country of our own where we can go and stand on our own feet and solve our own problems and not have to continue going to court or waiting for some politician to legislate for another hundred, hundred or two years to prove that we're human beings. Mr. Mr. Moderator, I've discussed this with Minister Malcolm before, and uh, after seeing Mississippi and Alabama close up, I'd be glad to give him those states if it were within my power to do so. Yet, as I, I think uh, I've said before, Why Minister Malcolm, Alabama? as I've said before, Minister Malcolm, the thing that bothers me about your idea of a black nation within a nation, presumably, if it can be affected then, is that if the white man hates us as much as you say he does, what a target that makes we have all together. All right. His deeds okay, but now let's see. Okay, if he hates us that much, then I would hate to be all gathered in one place. I'd rather be dispersed throughout this nation. He could drop one controlled atom bomb and wipe us out. He could uh, strangle us with a net of... Uh, wiping you out. He, he could out strangle us. May I, finish? May I finish? He certainly okay. did. <laughs> but he could strangle us with an economic... Loose around the world. Right. Right. I would rather be I would rather, be, I would rather be dispersed, Minister Malcolm, and I think then I would make a poor target. You know, um, uh, if you're all together, one gun can shoot you. Harlem is all together. Scattered. Washington D.C. is already all right, becoming all. Is, Washington D.C. has already become an all-black city. This is why Harlem is being strangled economically. I think now, and this is why this summer we plan to have task force people, volunteers working in key sections like Harlem, the Bedford-Stuyvesant area, and uh, Newark, New Jersey, to tackle these slums and to organize the tenants for possible rent strikes against the terrible conditions that exist there. Mr. Farmer, this is what I wanted to ask you when you mentioned your July 4th deadline before. What actually is going to take place on July the 5th? Well, I would not say July 5th. Maybe it'll be the evening of July 4th. Or maybe it'll be the morning of July 6th. But for those concerns that uh, parts of chains that have units in the South that are still segregated or South and North fail to employ Negroes without discrimination. There will be nationwide demonstrations in spontaneous in cities all over the country simultaneously. They will demonstrate, there will be sit-ins, there will be an economic boycott. We are now in negotiation with some of these companies, some of these chains, and uh, at least in one case, 
They have agreed complete desegregation and an end to discrimination in employment. And I hope others will come across by July 4th. If they don't, then we plan to take our necessary action. What do you think will happen? Well, I think that there will be some that won't come across. I think there will be some which will offer token compliance with our demands. And tokenism will not be accepted. We've gotten beyond tokenism now. We demand the whole loaf. We want an open city, open states, and an open country. We want, in other words, to get this nonsense of race and racism behind us so that we can uh, release the tremendous resources that are being tied up, not only in terms of money, in terms of talent and intelligence and thought to work on the problems of unemployment generally, the problems of disease and health, the other problems that uh, afflict all people in our country. When you say we, and we are going to uh, bring this about, mm -hmm. what do you mean? When I say we, I mean the Congress of Racial Equality and its 70 units throughout the country. And what about its connections with other Negro groups? To what extent will there be that unity of action? There is a complete cooperation between the groups, as uh, Reverend Wyatt Walker can tell you. We have worked closely with them and have enjoyed their support, and they have enjoyed our support in their projects. And we expect that that support and cooperation will be a continuing thing. The NAACP is another example of that cooperation in city after city in North Carolina. We are working closely with the NAACP in a coordinated drive we expect that there will be full coordination in this campaign for economic boycott. Well, then I would turn to Mr. Walker and ask him, what does he see happening on July 4th or 5th or 6th? Well, certainly, uh, whatever resources we have to put at the disposal of the uh, overall program of the Congress of Racial Equality as far as economic withdrawals, if they are going to withdraw their support from the Kresge chain or the Woolworth chain or the Sears Roebuck chain, uh, we have a moral commitment to cooperate with them, and we would notify our 85 affiliate organizations across the South to cooperate with them in this regard, because our goals are exactly the same. Uh, we may uh, differ in timing or methodology at one point or another, but uh, there's uh, very little theoretical or philosophical differences that we share. Uh, we insist that uh, the Negro individually and collectively must have the opportunity uh, as immediately as possible to move into the mainstream of American life without the uh, burden of his high visibility being uh, 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 an unnecessary uh, burden to him. What about economic instruments? Do you think these are the most effective, as Mr. Uh, Palmer was suggesting? Uh, I would agree absolutely. This is the one thing that gives uh, the Negro community leverage. Uh, I suppose in all good businesses, according to the Wall Street Journal, 6% is the margin of... Uh, of profit and the Negro community uh, is the critical margin in America with his income and with his buying power. Just uh, let us suppose what would happen if uh, we proposed to the automotive industry or some member of the automotive industry uh, that this fall, if we can't go to Detroit and look through the offices of General Motors or uh, Ford or somebody else and we can't find uh, it uh, dotted proportionally with Negroes. Uh, uh, what would happen to the stock market or the automotive industry if all Negroes joined a nationwide uh, effort to, not to buy new cars this fall? The margin of profit is so slim, I think it could have uh, a real effect on the Dow Jones average. Are you going to Detroit this fall to take that, to make that search? We are in the process of making a decision as to whether we will have a national conference in Detroit on uh, a, a nationwide selective buying campaign against some... Uh, major industry that does not practice fair employment. You say that decision still has to be made. What would be the arguments against it? Well, I, as a Negro, I don't know of any arguments against it. It could, with the accelerated thrust of the Negro community, it may be that uh, some other focus might have priority. Uh, you mean some other summer. industry? Some other industry or some other focus. But I gather what you gentlemen are saying that we can expect this year uh, to find some kind of massive economic... The year of 63 uh, is going to be a year of decision for America and for the Negro community. There's talk also now, of course, in the papers today, uh, on this day, of a, a massive march upon Washington. Uh, do you feel that this will take place? Uh, uh, if uh, reasonable goals are not reached on the national scene, I think it is highly probable. What do you mean by reasonable? Well, here again, uh, I suppose uh, you might consider this charitable, but uh, some good faith and uh, reasonable efforts and results 
uh, over this summer. Uh, I would say before Congress uh, uh, dismisses. Well, well, let me turn back to Mr. Farmer and ask him what he would consider reasonable. You haven't mentioned watches on Washington, but of course they appear in the uh, word of them appear, appear in the paper today. Uh, uh, do you think that this is going to achieve anything important for you? Well, I think it might. Uh, the more pressure we can maintain on the situation now, the better it'll be. And incidentally, Corps is cooperating in the plans for a march on Washington. We will be participating in it uh, if it is necessary for there to be a march. And by necessary, uh, I mean if uh, there is still discrimination in employment and still um, proportionately two and a half times as many Negroes unemployed in our country as whites then it'll be necessary for us to march on Washington. Oh, we've got to do, I'm sorry, Mr. Walker. We've got to do something about uh, the voting inequities in the South. Uh, I was so dismayed uh, at the program Meet the Press when Governor Wallace says to the nation that Negroes are voting all over Alabama, and I could name almost two dozen counties where a Negro has uh, uh, never voted uh, at all, where there are ten counties where no Negro has been on the registration list. Well, of course. And you've got a 21... Uh, question uh, form that has to be filled out and you the only way you know you're registered is you get a letter from the registrar who knows whether it goes into file 13 or not uh, two years ago we had a drive in montgomery alabama where 4,000 negroes applied and when the registration books were closed they announced that 210 odd people had uh, passed the test well this is all in the hands of uh, white registrars and white racists uh, uh, the Negro just cannot get a fair shake at the voting booth, and this is another one of our primary concerns. In a moment, we'll come back, and at that point, Mr. Palmer, I'd like to ask you, actually, whether, by definition, in terms of what you say the criteria must be to avoid such a march, there isn't going to have to be one, but let's talk about that in just a moment. Mr. Farmer, a moment or so ago, you were talking about the conditions which would have to exist if there were to be this march on Washington, if there were to be the kind of action that you gentlemen have talked about for the summer of this year. It seemed to me, as you describe what it is you feel must be accomplished to avoid that, that we're not going to avoid that. You seem to be asking for things that were quite legitimate, everyone at this table and many, many, many other people, but it didn't seem to me that it was too likely that you were going to achieve what it is you want to achieve. Does this mean that this summer, we'll see the kind of march on Washington, we'll see the kind of action that you're talking about. There will be a march on Washington early in the fall, unless these demands are met, and I, I think that they are legitimate demands. What the federal government has to do, or needs to do, in order to prevent such a march is, first of all, to pass strong civil rights legislation with teeth in it. Second, to see that all places that serve the public are completely desegregated, and third, stop using federal funds to subsidize segregation in the Area Redevelopment Administration where funds are loaned to businesses that want to build uh, units in the South, factories or what have you. Many of these uh, businesses that go South then employ only white persons. I saw a sign on a highway in South Carolina just a month ago stating that such and such a firm will build a factory here on this site 500 white women will be hired. Now this was to be with money loaned by the federal government to the concern. Well, that has to stop. We have to put an end to discrimination and employment. I think it can be done. I think it must be done. Do you assume that enough will be done by the fall of the year to avoid the kind of march you've talked about? Well, I'm not assuming anything. These, these are our demands. And if they are met, we'll be delighted because I don't want to march. I have bad feet. Uh, I, I don't like marching, but if I have to march, I will march because uh, there is something that is more important than my feet. In the criteria you establish, I wonder about the question of federal aid to education and the importance in your mind of preventing such aid from going to southern states or other states that practice, officially practice discrimination. Yes, as long as those states practice uh, segregation or discrimination officially, then federal funds should not be used there. Or unofficially. This, unofficially, yes. This was a recommendation of the Civil Rights Commission that all federal funds be withdrawn from Mississippi. I go along with that. I believe in it. Now, uh, CORE is uh, waging a campaign now um, against uh, school bonds that are issued by school districts, cities, and states in the Deep South where the schools are completely segregated. These bonds are marketed in seven northern states, including New York State. 
Hundreds of millions of dollars are involved. The people who put their money into those school bonds from segregated areas are thereby um, subsidizing segregation. Now, they may be uh, good people in the sense that they don't beat their wives, uh, they don't push ladies down subway uh, steps, they don't realize that the money that they are pouring into those bonds, they're investing into those bonds, are being used to build and maintain segregated facilities. Well, that should stop. Logically, of course, I have to go on and then ask the question about your concern for segregation in northern schools. And logically thereafter, I suppose I must ask about your attitude toward the bond issues floated in northern communities to support schools in which you do not feel uh, there has been sufficient effort toward uh, integration. Well, let me say that I think uh, segregated schools are bad and a violation of the Supreme Court ruling whether they are by law segregated or de facto segregated, by law in the South and de facto in the North. There's just as much school segregation in the North as there is in the South. So this will be the next step. Our first step in this campaign is to stop the errant segregation that exists by law in the South. Then we will turn this campaign into northern cities. We are presently, as you know, um, engaged in drives in city after city in the North to eliminate de facto segregation. There have been boycotts, student boycotts, in which we've been involved. And in Inglewood, where the local core chapter is involved, there has been for a long time now a study in. This is a new kind of in, where the kids, the children, who were boycotting the school decided that they would attend the other school where they wanted to go and would receive a better education. They are sitting in in those classes and studying, and I'm told that they're actually being called on now. But uh, still, they presumably will not receive any credit for the courses which they take there. Well, this sort of technique will be used more widely, following that, the economic approach. Well, I was just going to ask you that about that. You said this technique will be used more widely. Yes. Specifically, what are you referring to? Specifically, I'm referring to study ends, boycotts and study ends in northern schools which are de facto segregated. Are these planned as of now for the fall? These are being planned as of now for the fall. In particular localities? In various cities. I cannot specify the cities at the present time. All right, I, I cut off Mr. Morrison before. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say that the, uh, the proposal to uh, withdraw federal financial aid and subsidies uh, from those uh, southern states which uh, practice uh, segregation uh, officially, and as Reverend Walker pointed out, unofficially, is a good, sound one. It has been advocated before. It is not really new. But what uh, I think uh, was most significant historically uh, about the last demand was that it came from an official agency of the United States government, the United States Civil Rights Commission, which uh, uh, is significantly is predominantly white, and uh, it shows, I think, Minister Malcolm X, that there are uh, many white people who favor drastic action against the, the segregationists of the South and are seeking conscientiously to end segregation and to create equality between Negroes and whites in America. But uh, I would then know if there are many, if there are many whites who are trying to do this, why isn't more being done about it? Well, so one because of what you're saying in essence is that the government is responsible for, se for segregation that the government is subsidizing uh, segregation, that the government is the one that's actually instigating and carrying out this segregation that the politicians profess to be against. Well, one, uh, more should be done about it. Of course, I will readily grant that. But, uh, and the second point, I think that the, uh, the federal government is aiding and abetting the continuance of segregation in the South if it persists in, in, in making financial subsidies from public funds available to states which defy the courts of the land and which refuse to implement the uh, ruling of the United States Supreme Court in 1954. Uh, I, I also want to point out as strongly as possible that, the, uh, that successive, traditionally successive, federal administrations have failed to tackle the problem of using coercive action, and I, and I use that term in its constitutional context, against the segregationist southern governments. And they have done it for political reasons. All of the segregationist southern governments are Democrats. You have a, a Democratic administration sitting in Washington, D.C. Well, whoever practices it is still wrong. But the point is, how can the Kennedy brothers, 
who are Democrats and are supposedly the, some of the strongest politicians in this country uh, with political power, how is it that they cannot get their segregationist party members to go along with their program if the uh, program of the uh, uh, segregationists differs from the program of the uh, uh, whites who are in power in Washington, D.C.? Well, I don't, just one, I don't think they should try very hard, uh, because obviously there's a fundamental conflict. They have to be in, in cahoots with each a other. policy, philosophy, and ideology between the, the Democrats outside of the South and the Democrats in the South. The Democrats in the North never condemn and disassociate themselves from the Democrats in the South. It is the Democrats in the South who defect from the party. I wish to make one correction there. That was done in 1948 by uh, President Harry Truman, who, who challenged the segregationist South and introduced and advocated a civil rights program which resulted in the secession from the Democratic Party. It was a temporary secession, mind you. But nevertheless, it was, it was a secession. And was the civil rights program passed? No, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I'd like to point out that um, I, I don't think that the Deep South states can be persuaded or convinced by reasoning or by logic to desegregate, to end segregation. It has to be, as Alan Morrison indicated, uh, by using coercive means, either economic coercion or political coercion or what have you, or the type of coercion that we are using in the streets now. And I don't care whether this is done by a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. I don't think either one of them would be able to persuade or to convince Mississippi and Alabama why to say, desegregate. Uh, uh, Mr. Farmer, why say the Deep South when Englewood is not in the Deep South, New Rochelle is not in the Deep South, Chicago is not in the Deep South, and by your own admission, we have a, they, there is as much segregation practiced in the North as in the South, but it's done in a more subtle way. And the mistake that is made by many of our people who uh, are in this so-called civil rights struggle, I have to say so-called civil rights struggle, uh, is they always make a distinction between North and South. You don't find the black man in the South doesn't catch as much hell as the black man in the North. The only difference is the black man in the South know where it, knows where it is, and the black man in the North is being tricked every day by white liberals who grin in his face and pretend to be his friend, but at the same time is practicing segregation just as much as the, as the white man in the South is practicing it. Well, I don't, know, Malcolm, I, I don't know that I could accept that altogether, uh, Malcolm, because uh, you live in the North predominantly, and I don't think you could speak for the experience that uh, I or we as Southerners have. Uh, I think a Negro catches hell all over the country being a Negro, and I think we have said from our movement, I was speaking of Jim and the posture that Alan Morrison and I represent, that we say it is a national dilemma which has to be grappled with. It has different forms. Uh, I think uh, in the South, it's uh, not only emotional and psychological, but it's also physical. And I don't know whether you can uh, put a slide rule it to measure it. It's just a problem all over the nation, and we're on the threshold, I trust, of really grappling with it for the first time. In the it's South, mission. you're dealing with a wolf who lets you know where you stand. Tomorrow, in the North, we're dealing with a fox who grins in our face and makes us think that we're getting some kind of freedom or that we're in a different place. You are agreeing with me. Yes, let me say that I don't think it's a fruitful discussion as to whether the thing is worse in the South or worse in the North. It's bad as anything, both places, all over the country. And it doesn't matter the shape that it takes one place or another. Now, we are in the streets in the North, in Englewood, in California, in New York, California. just as we are in the streets in the South. And then what has been accomplished? What has been accomplished? What is being accomplished? Look at Philadelphia. Negroes are now being employed in the Negro construction. All right, four, yes. And we are continuing our pressure. Now, let me tell you, uh, Minister Malcolm, that we have gotten jobs for Negroes in Safeways grocery stores, in Crozier's grocery stores, in department stores, in seal test dairies, in concern after concern. And not four, Mr. Farmer. Not forty. Whenever you have, but they number in the hundreds. Whenever you have thousands of Negroes demonstrating for jobs, as was demonstrated beautifully yes. in Philadelphia, and then the leadership settled for four jobs, I can't see where that's progress. Now let me tell you, in our campaign against the leading dairy in New York, we did not settle for four jobs. We did not settle for forty jobs. The, More, wait, the demonstrations please. in Philadelphia no, were settled for four jobs. I'm not speaking of Philadelphia demonstration. I'm speaking of the dairy that we had a boycott against. We have more than 40 jobs already and many more are coming. 
Now, we're after not a token employment. We're after full employment. I'd like to say a further word on the employment question, Mr. Moderator, if I may. Please do. I think it's no longer adequate for an employer to say that I don't discriminate merely because uh, I um, accept uh, qualified applications and employ the best qualified of the persons who have applied. And it just so happens, accidentally, no Negroes who are qualified have applied. Now we are insisting that we see some Negroes there working. We're insisting that there be some dark faces working in those factories, those shops, and those offices. I think that it is impossible for the rear wheels of an automobile to catch up with the front wheels of an automobile while they're going at the same speed. It is necessary for there to be a new push. We say to the employer now that he has a responsibility not only to employ the best qualified person who applies, but to seek qualified Negroes and if they are not qualified for the specific job, to help train them and to admit them to all of his apprenticeship training classes. We say the same thing to the trade union because we've got to break out of this box where the Negro is at the bottom of the economic totem pole. This is what we're trying to do. It's well, not confined to Mississippi, Mr. X. Well, of course, this does raise the question, the one the point you just made, Mr. Farmer, as to whether there is not now a search for more than equality whether there isn't an effort now to make up as if one could for the hundreds of years during which the Negro has suffered outrages within our country. I think we've got to try. I think that the nation owes us a debt on this. But you the said, nation must pay that debt. May I just pursue it and exercise yes. some prerogative here? Um, you say the nation owes a debt yes. to the Negro community. Uh, is it a debt that can be paid within the context of what it is you basically want, the concept of equality? Well, I'm not sure what we're like trying to achieve is equality. Well, what we are trying to achieve is equality, and uh, we cannot achieve equality while the Negro remains at the bottom, frozen at the bottom of the economic ladder. Now, the statistics are rather cruel, and the statistics show that the gap between the average income for Negroes in this country and the average income for whites has not closed. In other words, it is fantastic uh, to do as Governor Wallace has done in Alabama and compare the Negro standard of living in this country with the standard of living in Africa or Europe or Canada. The only fair comparison is with the standard of living in the rest of America. And the gap has not closed. It did close a bit during World War II. But that, as you know, was because of temporary employment in wartime industries. When the war was over, those jobs were locked off. In the past uh, 15 years, the gap has widened slightly, which means that if we are to achieve equality, we've got to find some way for the back wheels of the car to catch up to the front wheels of the car without a collision. Well, it let's, 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 one my, oh, go ahead now. Uh, it, no, it means that the only time the black man in this country has made any progress was when in wartime. When the white man has his back to the wall, then he lets the black man come forward a little bit. And as soon as the war is over, he tells the black man, get back off me now. And I think, sir, with all due respect to you and the others who are here, when you sit and analyze the problem as it actually is and see the hypocrisy that has been practiced by whites when they talk this love talk and equality talk, uh, sooner or later you'll be able to see that since we don't make any progress only during wartime, It'll take another war for the black man to take any more steps in the right direction. Minister and, Malcolm? And, no, just, I didn't cut you off when you spoke there for 15 minutes. The moderator wouldn't let me. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you see the, the, the grit or the, the uh, economic rut that our people are in, and as you point out and he points out, the union excludes us from them to keep us out. And if the union, union doesn't do it, management does it. We are caught in a grip between unit union management, or I should say a conspiracy, between the union, the management, and the government to keep us at the bottom of the economic ladder, the bottom of the housing ladder, the bottom of the educational ladder. And after experiencing that in a country for a hundred years, I don't see how you could have any hope or confidence that this same race that has been doing it is not going to continue to do it only in a different way with more 20th century or up-to-date or shrewd methods today than they had to use in the past. We you say, that, you say that progress is achieved only in wartime. It has all been achieved by All right, now wartime. you say that. We're in a war now. We're in a war now. The war is being waged in the streets of Birmingham, the streets of Greensboro, the streets of Danville, Virginia. That's being not waged. the war. Now, wait a minute. No, this is, is the war. 
This is not the war. This is the war. This is the result of the war. Uh, no. America no. is at war with Russia. Let's, 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 let's let, let me let's pursue talk. the point. This is the Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War was not finished at all. The Revolutionary War, 1776, provided uh, independence and freedom, in a sense, for some Americans, but excluded black Americans. This is Revolutionary War Part Two. To take those beautiful words of the Declaration of Independence, of the preamble to the Constitution, and make them a reality for black people as well as white. Now, we are waging that war. If you don't like this war, that's all right. No, wait but a don't deny that it is a war. Now, Dr. X, may I, may I interrupt at this point and just ask Mr. Walker, who is champing at the bit over here, for his comment. Yeah, I wanted to buttress what uh, Jim was saying about employment. Uh, I think the Philadelphia instance is one instance. In Atlanta, we have what we call Operation Breadbasket. We're dealing with one consumer industry, the uh, bread industry, and less than three and a half months using the technique that Jim described of buying where we can get jobs on a proportionate basis, we created for the Negro community $400,000 in new jobs. Now, this means that a man who was a delivery man who was making $40 a week now has a job as a bread salesman and makes $115, $125 a week. He has four children. If he had stayed as a delivery man, those four kids would not have had an opportunity at college and emancipating themselves educationally. Now they have a chance at college. And when you add $400,000 uh, to the income of the Negro community in any city uh, j through just one industry, then it seems to me that this is a legitimate and reasonable result for the kind of techniques and methods that we use. Yeah, I, and, I, and as we were against the catalog of ills which you recite, which we, which we would agree with, that it is a fair commentary. I would like to know what, what alternative do you propose as over against what we do? That's, that's a fair enough question. Let's wait for a break to get the answer. Malcolm X, I'm sure that you'll want to reply to Mr. Walker's question. Yes, uh, the, um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that after 400 years in this country, a country uh, to which we've contributed our free labor, sweat, blood, we've given our lives to make it or help make it what it is. And today, because the white man says that it's time now for us to get integration or what he calls freedom, and many of the so-called Negroes who take him seriously and believe that what he says is uh, he means it, they try and take advantage of it, and they end up, end up getting beaten with uh, police clubs or fire hoses or having dogs sicked upon them, simply because they believe what the white man says, that he intends for us to have freedom, justice, and equality. So Mr. Muhammad says in the face of all of this, since we see that we just can't get uh, justice here, and by justice I mean economic uh, security, political security, social security, and so forth, uh, the, the best solution is for the white man to allow the 20 million black people in this country to go back to our own home those who want to go back to our own home and to our own people, and that the government itself should uh, give us everything we need to go back to our own home and start life anew in our own uh, land among our own people. And then if the government uh, doesn't want to do that, since we, uh, they don't want us to leave and they want us to stay here with them, uh, we don't get along together, then Mr. Muhammad says the best solution is to separate part of the country here and give us a place to ourselves where we can then go and set up our own agricultural system, our own economic system, and try and do something to provide food, clothing, and shelter and the things that uh, our people need in order to, to live. In other words, give us a chance to solve our own problem uh, among ourselves on some land of our own instead of continually trying to force us into white society where the white society knows we're absolutely not wanted and a white society which knows it will never accept its ex-slave on the same level with itself as something equal with itself. Well, of course, this kind of separatism uh, hawks back, I think, to something that Mr. Farmer said before that I'd like to pick up, too. It isn't, uh, Mr. Farmer said, I suspect he would not want equated with that separatism, but you, were, you said something before about the rear wheels of the car not being able to catch up with the front wheels. And you're hinting here that at something more or less, and I think it might be legitimate to say there would be some who would say it was something less than equality, if you're <coughs> saying that there must be something compensatory now yes. for the indebtedness of centuries. Well, I think the analogy that I used um, has a bearing upon separatism only in the sense that the back wheels are separate from the front wheels of a car. 
Needless to say, I'm not uh, in favor of splitting the car down the middle, or one-tenth and nine-tenths, and moving the back wheel someplace else. I don't think that they'll get along. I don't think that they'll be motivated by the motor. Well, what, are you, what are you asking for? I'm asking for compensatory, preferential hiring. I think that it is essential for the salvation of this nation. Now, a study was conducted by the President's Commission of Economic Advisers, which came out with some very interesting and I think significant uh, figures. It indicated that the gross national product uh, of the whole nation suffers to the tune of $13 billion a year because of discrimination in employment against Negroes. To put it another way, if the training and skills and qualifications of Negro citizens, as they are now, were fully utilized in employment, $13 billion a year would be added to the national economy. Now, if, in addition to that, the training, the skills, and the education of Negroes in this country was brought up to the level of that of whites, and then there are new skills and training and education utilized in employment to the full, $17 billion a year would be added to the national economy. I say that to say that I think that it's in the interest of the nation and its welfare now to adopt a policy of compensatory treatment because of the discrimination of a hundred years, discrimination in education, in training, and in employment. Otherwise, we will not break this vicious cycle. Mr. Morrison? Well, this uh, principle of uh, compensatory or preferential uh, treatment for Negro Americans is uh, re relatively new and it results from uh, the findings, as Mr. Farmer has uh, outlined, of uh, American social scientists and uh, exhaustive research conducted by a Negro leadership uh, organization such as the National Urban League. Uh, we have discovered that uh, the treatment accorded the Negro in American life has imposed uh, a monumental, massive disabilities uh, which cannot be corrected uh, overnight, nor can, can they uh, be straightened out uh, simply by uh, granting, either by executive order or legislation, equality of opportunity. Now, equality of opportunity used to be the phrase used, mm -hmm. but it is not enough. Uh, equality has to be, uh, the word equality has to be broadened, it has to be deepened, and, and it has to apply to the, the tragic circumstances uh, which white America uh, has created for the Negro population. Uh, the Negro population is educationally disadvantaged, it's uh, vocationally disadvantaged, and in every other sense, it, it has handicaps which cannot be altered or corrected without compensatory treatment. This means that the Negro has to be given more than equal consideration. Uh, the the Ameri American society, federal government, state governments uh, have to uh, inaugurate policies uh, and consistently apply them, which uh, take into consideration the historical deprivation of equal rights, of the right to education and economic growth of the Negro people. Otherwise, uh, the Negro will be traveling at a tremendous disadvantage. He's got to catch up, and he has to be assisted to catch up, because this is what uh, our society, and let's face it, what white people have done to Negro people in this country, and something has got, got to be done dramatically to make up for the gap. And the gap is widening, incidentally. We used to say that the Negro condition was improving and rising, but we now know that the condition of the Negro population uh, 10 years ago was actually better than it is now. In other words, the gap in income, the gap in education is growing, and it has to be closed. This, this, is, is, exactly, this is exactly why we say uh, in our Operation Breadbasket, when we go to the consumer industry, that we want 14 or 18 new jobs created for Negroes, uh, that we won't accept when they say, well, can you find us somebody? So, no, the burden is on you. You find them or else we will have to tell our people that uh, we cannot in good conscience patronize your product. But of course, it seems to me, if, if I may suggest this, that the word compensatory is, uh, is, is a strange one. Compensation. Can, can the Negro possibly be compensated 
for the hundreds of years of deprivation. No, Isn't never, that a matter no, of never, but it can be Let me say, you change the terminology. I, I don't care what you call it. A rose by any other name smells just as sweet. Well, well, you can call it what the president has called it, incidentally. He's called it positive affirmative action. The president uh, stepped off of a plane once, and uh, this was early in his administration, and looked, I believe, at uh, one of the armed guards that was standing there and noticed that there were no Negroes. He didn't uh, ask, well, now, how many qualified Negroes have uh, applied and were they as highly qualified as the other people who apply. He called the officer and said, I don't see any Negroes here in the group. The officer said, well, Mr. President, no Negroes have applied. The president, as reported by the press, said to him, go out and find some. Now, we've been receiving special treatment for three to four hundred years here. We've been receiving special treatment of a negative nature. Now we're asking for the kind of special treatment that is positive and affirmative. How will that special treatment be manifested in other areas, in housing and in education, for instance? May I say one thing about, about that housing? Yes, please. I meant to have said it earlier, but uh, I think this uh, uh, principle of, of compensatory treatment should also apply to any action taken by the federal government in, 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 in trying to achieve equality uh, opportunity or access to the national housing market. Now, this is one of my major criticisms of President Kennedy's executive order on housing. It, it, it's, it applies only to housing to be built uh, from the date of the, of the order and, and future uh, federally financed housing, whereas to uh, give the Negro people of this country a fair break uh, and really uh, a chance to, to get into housing and to get out of ghettos he should have included all housing that had been constructed with public funds. That's right. All federally financed housing should have been included, but he didn't. And this is what is frequently happening. Happening when the Negro makes a gain, uh, the gain starts as of now. But, 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 be but it's because, something uh, less, because the story. Negro didn't make the gain. See, as long as someone is giving you something, he can always take it back. And this is the mistake where this is where our people are making the mistake. We are sitting, waiting. For uh, white, nobody gets either the Negro in, either, either in, uh, I don't mean it in that sense. Either in court or out of court, we've been sitting and waiting for the man to give us some concessions. Now, whenever you ask the, uh, if you're asking the white power structure for jobs, that's only a temporary uh, solution. If you ask the white power structure for housing, that's a temporary solution. As Mr. Farmer said, uh, they where the Negro used to ask for equality, now he's asking for more. He's asking for more than equality. Well. Likewise, if they give us more than equality, 10 years from now, we're going to be asking for more than that because the problem has still not gotten a real solution. Mr. Moderator. Just one moment, let me finish what I'm going to say. Uh, as long as we uh, accept the temporary solution, the problem will go unsolved. It'll be solved for you and me right now, but not for our children. If the black nations in Africa, uh, most of which have uh, less, a less number of educated Africans than, there, than exist among black people in this country, Yet they can establish their own independent nations and try and do, create a future for their people. Then Mr. Muhammad says, here in America, there are enough black people who profess to be educated. And when all of this, uh, with all this talk about equality with the white man, if we're equal with the white man, why can't we separate from him and set up our own government and go for ourselves and solve our own problems? Is Mr. Farmer, Mr. Farmer, one brief question. If we, can, if we can stick for a moment to this notion of compensatory action, I, I really think that we ought to work on this one for a moment because it still seems to me, and it probably does seem to a number of people, to have within it uh, the germs or the seeds of disaster itself. That's why I go back to the question of housing and education. Uh, let's, let's, let's pick education. How does one bring about compensatory action in education? By having better schools for young Negro children than for white children, if we are talking about integration? That is very simple. By providing, by providing remedial training in reading and in uh, arithmetic, and by providing the best of teachers to these schools which have deprived children in them. By now, when you say deprived children, yes. you're not limiting this to Negro children alone. Of course, but a larger percentage of Negro kids are deprived than whites. And therefore, I think a larger percentage of the most skilled teachers are required in that section. All right. Now, I, I, I grant that. But the question, the question I'm still trying to iron out, and I think Mr. Farmer has for me, is this question as to whether the, the compensation for discrimination and the lack of equality is to be another kind of discrimination or another kind of inequality. And I think you answer that in the negative when you say that in the schools that you would establish for the 
previously underprivileged or the underprivileged would include schools for children, not just Negroes, but Puerto Ricans and other underprivileged persons. Am I correct in that assumption? Yes, I think you're right there. We, I would not uh, limit our employment demands to Negroes. I would include Puerto Ricans and other minorities throughout our country, which have been similarly discriminated against, though not for so long a period of time as Negroes. The Puerto Ricans weren't enslaved. Slave. Yeah, this is a problem that stems from slavery. Now, and this compensation, yes, sir, this compensation is coming to people who were enslaved by the white man for 400 years. The Puerto Ricans don't even fit into this picture. Well, they do fit into it. No, they the, do fit into the it. problem is the Negro problem. Yeah, they're not lynching ne uh, Puerto Ricans. If a dark-skinned Puerto Rican went down to Mississippi, he as probably as he would be lynched too. If he Spanish, he wouldn't no. be lynched. No, they don't it's ask the Negro him. here, and as long as he can speak Spanish or some other language, or if he ties his head up with a, with a turban or something, he can go anywhere in Mississippi or in your home that he desires. You're not aware of the fact, yeah. are you, that African students have been arrested in our demonstrations in the South? When they've been they speak French. When they have been mistaken for the so-called Negro in America, they've been arrested. What I'm saying is that many Puerto Ricans are mistaken for Negroes. As long I as do not think discrimination discrimination stems only from slavery. It, it, let, me, let me turn to Mr. Walker. Uh, I wanted you say that uh, Mr. Farmer's idea of compensatory uh, treatment of the Negro has portents of disaster. It does have portents of disaster for the system from which the Negro community is suffering. And over against that, uh, I don't think uh, Malcolm X's analogy of the nations in Africa that, uh, and Asia that are freeing themselves, you have there on the one hand uh, a black or brown majority, whereas the Negro community in America is a black or brown uh, minority. And I don't think the analogy quite holds water, and this is why we... But your uh, whole philosophy comes out of India. This nonviolent thing is based upon 400, 400 million Indians doing passive uh, sit-down on 100,000 whites, and you, you, you use that. Well, in this country, you're still a minority, yet you're going to use tactics that was used by a, a dark minority in another land. I think this shows how little you know about nonviolence, because not Gandhi together. began his comp campaign among the Indians in South Africa, who are a minority. And they're still, in, in, and they're still a minority, and they still have the problem, but Gandhi's, oh, fame, the... Ga Gandhi's fame came from having gotten freedom for the people of India from the English, and, and he used nonviolent methods, which means you have a great big dark elephant-type creature sitting down on a little white mouse. But here in America, you have a, a little uh, black mouse trying to pull a sit-down, non-violent neck. Let me, let me pursue right this, elephant. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, just for a minute, and then I'll exercise non-violent methods to enforce a break. Just go ahead. Non-violence is uh, more effective when you have large numbers of people. That is what we've found out in Birmingham. It's what we've found out all over North Carolina. What did you gain in Birmingham? Now, wait a minute. Let me tell you what we've gained in North Carolina. What did you gain you in Birmingham? Ask? Let I'll me tell you what we've gained there. He can answer that. This was his campaign in Birmingham. Ask me about our campaign. What did you gain in North Carolina? Carolina? Let me tell you what we've gained. We've gained jobs. We've gained open employment in Greensboro, North Carolina. The, one of the officials of the city who is in charge of employment has announced that here and after, all city employment will be on a merit basis and there'll be no discrimination. A committee has been set up whereby grievances of individuals who feel that they've been discriminated against because of race will be dealt with. We are represented on that committee. In six cities in North Carolina, the theaters have desegregated. Places that serve the public in five cities have desegregated. And the whole state is becoming an open state. Now, wait a minute. Is it a gain to go to a theater for a man who hasn't got a job? It's a gain a to get a job. It's a gain to get a job, and it's jobs that we're providing. Now, it's a gain also to go to the theater. It's a gain because it's not the theater so much, it's not the cup of coffee at the lunch counter. It's the dignity that a person achieves. Is it a gain to have a business over on the other side of the tracks to which you can go, but when you walk downtown, you're discriminated against and cannot go there? It's a gain. What I say, Mr. X, is that all places that serve the public, black and white, must serve all members of the public. We are members of the public, whether you want to admit it or not. If we're not members of the public, then what are we? Is why do you place, have the race I... problem in this country if we're members of the public? Now we're members of the public, I... and that's why we are trying to wipe out racial discrimination. You'll may never I, wipe however, it out with a desegregated have... theater. Well, I we're wiping it out with jobs. May I, however, ineffectually, over the past 60 seconds, try to have a break now, and we'll be back in just a moment.
Gentlemen, this is the last segment of our program, and it seems to me, and uh, you all will grant that quickly, that we could go on forever with it. I would just like to say, at this end point, as the moderator, who probably shouldn't uh, involve himself overly much, that still as a white man, I'm concerned with the notion that there is just one white man in this country, and that he feels a certain way, and that his attitude toward the Negro is such and such. I think that you probably recognize, as there are differences among you in certain tactics and approaches that you take, there are many, many differences among white men. And I think that uh, it is, would be a mistake in this program not to think in terms, for a few moments, of interracial activities, of what is being done and uh, what can be done, what should be done. Mr. Morrison, I, I wonder whether this theme has any meaning, validity to you. Yes, it does have. Uh, uh, America's destiny, in my opinion, is to be one nation, united, uh, undifferentiated according to uh, degrees of citizenship, uh, in which racial chauvin uh, chauvinism is, is outlawed and prevented from being expressed. Uh, I feel that this dramatic drive which we are witnessing and in which some of us are participating toward uh, real equality, which means desegregation, and integration uh, can only be accomplished by a, an increasing uh, cooperation, collaboration between uh, the Negro people and those uh, enlightened uh, white people. And there are many enlightened white people, unfortunately, uh, too many of them are, are not uh, disposed to express themselves or to join with Negroes hand in hand in the struggle. We have here to tonight, uh, two men, Mr. Farmer and Reverend Walker, who represent organizations that are founded on that principle, that white and Negro Americans can join together in this great crusade. Uh, it has to be done, because uh, the question of the Negro status and the abolition of the injustices uh, uh, which the Negro uh, suffers is the dominant question in American life today. To me, it takes precedence over any other issue you can name. It should have priority. Uh, the priority is so important that I think it, it demands that uh, President Kennedy perhaps suspend his European trip and stay in this country and fight for the legislation which he will introduce next week. America has got to achieve this destiny of equal rights for all its citizens or else it will not survive. Mr. Farmer, do you find that the interracial efforts continue to have the validity that you've hoped for many years that they would have? Or do you feel that perhaps Malcolm X's uh, emphasis upon real separatism is beginning to seem more and more correct? Well, needless to say, I'm opposed to separatism. Now, I do not say that Harlem and a hundred Harlems throughout the country should be destroyed or Negroes cannot live together. It's not that Negroes don't like to associate with Negroes and want to associate with white people. What Negroes want is a choice. They want to, to be able to live in gorgeous gardens if they choose, or a lovely lane. They may not choose. They may choose to live in Harlem, as many of them will. So we ought to clean up the problems there. Now this is the approach that CORE takes, and CORE is an interracial organization. Always has been. We feel that this problem is not just the black man's problem. It's a problem for all Americans, whether white or black. All of them suffer. I look at the white man even in the South, and I see, I pity the segregationist. I think that he is as much a victim of the historical forces about which we've been talking as the Negro has. Now, um, we are trying to free him as we gain freedom for ourselves. One white student down in Tennessee, Lebanon, Tennessee, said to me when I was talking about freedom, after the speech, he said, uh, well, Mr. Farmer, I'm not free either, that I have a Negro friend and I can't go downtown and have a Coke with my Negro friend. So we're trying to provide freedom for the white people as well as the Negroes in this country. Now I think that there should be an increasing pride among Negroes or black people. I think that there should be pride among all Americans because we ought to be proud of what we are, our heritage and our traditions. America is not a melting pot in the sense that people disappear. America is a melting pot in the sense that people come together uh, out of proud traditions, out of cultures, feeling that they have something to contribute to the total overall culture. 
Negroes increasingly are finding something in their background, their heritage, their culture to contribute. This, I think, is the future of America. Malcolm X, I wonder whether you can accept the notion that a white man is no more responsible for his skin than is a man who is black. If he's not responsible for his skin, he is responsible for his deeds. And the collectively, the white people in this country are guilty today and must uh, accept the blame for the collective uh, criminal act that was committed against black people by bringing our people to this country. And uh, if it is not the whiteness of his skin for which the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that he's entering into condemnation today, it is his deeds, and he can't separate his, you can't hardly separate his deeds from his skin. Um, uh, the country that has been established here has been established by white people for the benefit of white people, the economic system, the political system, the educational system of America has been uh, uh, set up primarily for the benefit of white people. Many Our people were brought here in chains, forcibly, not on the Mayflower, but in slave ships, to add to the American economy, and we've been exploited politically, economically, and otherwise ever since. And many of these same white people, Malcolm X, are attempting now to change that structure, to change what it is that you say. I think that there are very few there's no one at this table, and there are very few people I know who would deny the validity of much that you describe, but the potential for the future, the potential not for the distant future, but for the here and now. And I turn to Mr. Walker and ask him whether in his own activities in the South now, which is so real, and have achieved certain things, whether they haven't been achieved, these achievements haven't been made with the assistance, North and South, of certain white men. Oh, absolutely, and uh, this, uh, perhaps I could hinge it on uh, the question raised by Malcolm a little earlier, but what has Birmingham achieved? Uh, maybe there is no one, two, three, and uh, what was uh, resolved in the agreement or truce that was made uh, is minimal when you consider how completely emasculated the Negro community was in Birmingham. But as over against the mayhem and the murder and the police brutality and the economic deprivation that uh, the Negro suffered in Birmingham particularly, in Alabama generally. Uh, the Negro has proved in this new militancy that has been evidenced by Birmingham that when we rise up in mass numbers, we can so completely immobilize not only a city, but the uh, police force of an entire state and further dramatize to the nation the urgency of the problem, which is exactly what Birmingham has done. Uh, I don't think anybody would gainsay that had it not been for Birmingham, we would not have had this thrust this summer. It will, it will represent a watershed in the revolution of what, the Negro community What do you think is in the, the impact of Birmingham upon white support for your movement in the North as well as the South? I think, uh, I, I describe it this way, that there are two kinds of white people uh, in America. They are committed to the movement, which is a small number. And then there are those who are committed by the movement that we have so dramatized through the nonviolent technique, and I speak of all the organizations. Was Birmingham nonviolent? Uh, not altogether, but 95% so it was. Uh, we have dramatized that the urgency of the problem has got to be dealt with now, whereas some people uh, expect uh, the resolution of the race problem to come in on the wheels of inevitability, and it doesn't happen like that. Somebody's got to prod it, somebody's got to push it, Somebody's got to put severe pressure on it to create the kind of crisis that Birmingham represented so that it becomes a national issue, which is what we are facing now. Of course, I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. Farmer, too, what he feels the impact has been of the action of the past year and past two years upon support and understanding on the part of the white community. Well, I think there's been much more support. Uh, there are growing evidences that uh, many people in the white community are now waking up to the fact that this thing has got to go segregation has got to be ended. And I think they're determined to do something about it. Now, we will keep up the pressure. We'll stay in the streets, as I, I say. And I would welcome white persons to join us there. I would welcome allies in the struggle. We need all the allies we can have, all that we can get, because this is a tremendous struggle. Does your militancy turn away whites? Oh, no. Our core is thoroughly interracial, and we find very frequently that whites are just as willing to risk their lives or their livelihoods as Negroes are. Nearly 30 years later, the Open Mind continued its discussion with James Farmer and Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. Gentlemen, we've survived. Alan Morrison is gone, and Malcolm X was assassinated. Not all that much after our program together, a couple of years. But 
long enough for him seemingly to have shifted his own orientation, his sense of separatism, which he, he was expressing at, uh, at our program together. Which Malcolm, which civil rights movement is going to be remembered? The separatist, the integrationist? Well, I think the, uh, and I, I do not choose to call the, the phrase integrationist, I think it's desegregationist. I think that's the movement that's going to be remembered. And uh, there was a large cadre of us who were not concerned about being with white people to give any kind of affirmation to ourselves, but to be sure that there was a guarantee that we as American citizens had access to everything else all other Americans had access to. But the verbiage of the media in that time, you know, uh, in a sense brainwashed people's opinion. But we were more desegregationists than we were integrationists. Do you object, too, to that uh, word, Jim Farmer? No, I don't object to it. I think it has been redefined and needs further redefinition. It seems to me that what has happened is we had thesis, we had antithesis, and we now have synthesis. Malcolm moved closer toward the civil rights movement after his return from Mecca. Absolutely. And the civil rights movement moved closer to Malcolm with black identity becoming a part of the civil rights struggle. So the mainstream of the United States civil rights struggle today is part um, integrationist and part um, black identity and uh, Afrocentrism, if you will. This is a combination of the two, and that's what will be remembered. And successful? Well, well I, I don't uh, <laughs> subscribe to it being successful. I remember the morning that I stood by the Washington Monument on the Great March in 63, and I really believe with all my heart that the beloved community was just around the corner, <laughs> seven, eight years away. And now here, 30-some years later or more, I know I will not see it in my lifetime even if I live to be 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And that's the reality. There's the illusion that progress has been made, but the reality is that what progress has been made has been more cosmetic than it has been co consequential. May I comment Please. on that, too? Um, I missed the march on Washington, by the way. Why? You were, you were in, in jail. Prison. jail. Yeah, was, you were in Parchman in the State slam. Prison, yes. And, uh, not Parchman, no, no, no. I was in Plaquemine, Louisiana. Plaquemine, fan. Yeah, right. Well, you were in jail so much as easily <laughs> where you were. Where, yeah. Uh, successful, we were successful in the initial goals. Those were short-term, or short-range. We were fighting against Jim Crow, against segregation, and not against racism, unfortunately, and we may have confused the two. We thought that by knocking down the for colored and for white signs, we would solve the race problem. That was far too simplistic. We did knock out Jim Crow, which was U.S. form apartheid, if you will. But what remained was racism, and that's a concept, that's an idea, that's a belief that the skin color and hair texture has something to do with morality, with character, with intelligence, and other human qualities. That remains with us. Racism is here, and now we've got to uh, exert the same kind of energy and diligence in fighting against racism as we did in fighting against Jim Crow. Yeah, but Dr. Walker seems to feel that's not a battle that's going to be won. Is that well, unfair? I don't, gonna, I don't think it's going to be won in my time, and the reason I don't think it's going to be won in my time is that my view of American history is that its <clears throat> foundation began with the wedding, voluntarily or involuntary, of capitalism and racism. Uh, racism justified, was justified by the capitalist system. And until we have a radical change in our economic system in America, I don't think we're going to make any serious dent in the effects and the symbols of racism in our, in our American society. I don't see uh, any much possibility that socialism will come in this country. It certainly will not be called socialism. It'll be called free enterprise if it does come. But <laughs> I think you're right, Jim. Yeah, but racism um, can be overcome. We socialize our kids from the beginning of their consciousness to believe that they somehow are superior to people of different cultures um, and that being different is somehow being bad. 
if it's uh, if you do have to be taught to hate you do have to be taught to be a racist then it is equally true that you can be untaught but let me turn that around do you believe that you have to be taught to hate of course you do oh absolutely. of course you do south pacific was right in that uh, musical it said you have to be taught you have to be taught you have to be carefully taught to hate and it is true children uh, before they are socialized by their parents and their peers and their schools don't hate people because of differences See, that, is, that is the reason richard why so many americans white americans do not feel or understand that they are racist they are racist involuntarily it's the way things have always been and they think they're being american and if you're american you are racist now may i say one of the things about malcolm was that um in his pre mecca days he believed that white racism was genetic in other words they had it god or allah as he would have put it gave it to them <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it uh, after mecca he saw that that is not true he in mecca saw white Muslims worshiping Allah kneeling beside him and he was convinced then that racism as he had witnessed it in America was learned and not genetic and if it is learned I repeat it can be unlearned so Jim nearly 30 years ago you said you thought it would take maybe five years maybe ten years and you could go fishing <laughs> <laughs> when i remind yes. you of that if you wyatt is right i'll go fishing in the next life now yeah, both of us uh, both of us were more optimistic about the possibility of change in american society than we needed to be and i confess in this redo that uh Malcolm was more accurate about an assessment of where America was on race than we were at that point in time. Yes, but the funny thing is he began to change his position. Well, Jim, we Jim has him. been given a very clear analysis of how the two strains of philosophy move toward each other. And I think he's absolutely accurate in that regard, is that the uh, civil rights movement as we knew it in the 60s, uh, incorporated as a part of it its black identity, Afrocentrism, and Malcolm softened his position about all white people being blue-eyed devils. And he, that's, a, that's an absolutely clear and straightforward analysis of what has happened. The side effect has been that with the rise of ethnic pride, somehow, in a bizarre way, uh, the ethnic pride of blacks has induced in other ethnic communities, it has sharpened their resentment and hostility that's toward that's people who are not too. like that. That's them. true, too. I, I do want to emphasize that we made some changes. Wyatt made some changes. The SCLC made some changes. And CORE did, too, in this country. We did wipe out Jim Crow for all practical purposes. We just overestimated the impact that would have on changing the life condition of the black American. And I think it needs to be said, uh, although it doesn't sound like from my earlier comments, uh, it, it was a significant change. Yes. When you consider that segregation, both by mores and by legal fiat, had been in place for nearly a hundred years, and our movement in a decade and a half completely dismantled segregation yes. by Moray that and Fia. Right. So that is a significant, yeah. but it did not solve the deeper problem, as Jim has outlined, about racism that was in the body politic of, of this nation. And I believe that we can solve that problem, too. You think there are going to be those, there'll be Malcolms out there, Malcolm then, when we all were together nearly 30 years ago, who will say that's more soft-headed thinking. That's more pie in the sky by and by. But the second Malcolm, from the time of his visit to Mecca, right. would say that's not pie in the sky. It can be done. Is, is that so true? Yes, Was that disillusionment true. on his no, part? With no, no, it is true. It can be done, but it has to be done with intentionality and aggressiveness on the part true. of our government. And our true. government has never been intentional enough nor aggressive enough on seeing to it that every American citizen is guaranteed the right of access to everything all other Americans have. And I cite as an example the fact that we've had in the climate of America a change in the position of the Supreme Court where they have all but dismantled affirmative action programs and you had these so-called anti-affirmative action Supreme Court decisions, you know, and a president whose name I don't want to call who talked about quota, a quota bill, you know, all kinds of rationales in order to deter and to obstruct the free access of every American 
to everything all other Americans. Maybe President-elect Clinton, I will call his name, yes. uh, will have a different point of view and will take a stronger stand. Well, he's made an important uh, statement today or yesterday that the Haitians whom the gentleman whose name mm -hmm. I don't want to mention yeah. turned away, that they will be received. Maybe he can take the leadership then in starting us off on the right track in fighting against racism in this country as we fought against Jim Crow years ago. Let me, let me, let me ask a, 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 a stickler question here. Do you think that gentleman, Ronald Reagan, whose name you don't want to mention, uh, do you think he did not reflect the country he led Reagan, no, he pretty much reflected uh, the country he led because he made, in my view, he made racism popular in America. Legitimate. Uh, legitimate. Legitimate, yeah, yeah. legitimate and popular. I mean, it was the way to be. And it is because he was so isolated from what was going on in race relations in America, he was, he was supremely naive and or ignorant for a sitting president on matters of race. And he took the guilt and the shame out of being racist. Now it's all right people to be racist. Maybe we can turn that around with a new president. The leadership, then, is what you're, what you're saying. The, was it the kind of leadership, remember that night before we met, Kennedy's speech? Um, there was such a high moral quality to that. Yes, and you must remember not only that speech, but the speech that John Kennedy made in January, when he said very clearly that we didn't need any more civil rights legislation, that it was sufficient. And it was our movement which turned John Kennedy around. It was Birmingham, yes, specifically. Yes, Birmingham specifically turned him around on the, on the matter of the need for new civil rights legislation. The King and Wyatt Walker demonstration well, from Birmingham. We, we had a lot of help, Jim. You were there with us with your troops as well. It was the one time that all of the movement forces, including some part of the NAACP, joined with us in that great Birmingham confrontation, which, yeah, you're which right. brought us to the, the point where we could not only have a, a public accommodations bill, but gave us the foundation. It made our movement legitimate in, on the American scene, and then led to Selma to Montgomery, which brought about the Voting Rights Act, which changed the entire complexion of political activity in the South. Is You're there right. a parallel, parallel unity today? Well, you have a fragmentation. For instance, uh, CORE went off the deep end in nationalism. They did not... Uh, they didn't stay there. They went to uh, right-wing republicanism after that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How did you let that happen? Oh, I didn't let it happen. It happened after I'd left. It was infiltrated. It, infiltrated. It happened after McKissick, my successor. Yes. And now what do you feel? We have 30 seconds left. Gentlemen, well, optimism? Uh, SCLC has been forced into being a regional organization. We do not really have a national civil rights movement. No. But the hope is that you do have local civil rights activities, which is very bright and very dynamic and very energetic. And that's the hope for tomorrow. I suppose the hopeful note is reflected, uh, repeated in your own thinking. Yes, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we can get together now. The movement, the organizations don't have a sense of objective. We don't know where we're going specifically. And that's partly because we fail to have long-range planning. Yes, I have said that the Achilles heel of our era, Jim, is that we were so optimistic that we did not train the next generation to take over for us when we passed off the scene. Gentlemen, maybe this program today will help bring you back as uh, examples and leaders. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jim Farmer, Dr. Wyatt T. Walker. Jim Farmer is gone now, too. Dr. Walker survives, as does the problem of race in America. I hope you in the audience will join me again next time on The Open Mind. And if you would like to share your thoughts about today's special program, please write The Open Mind, P.O. Box 7977, FDR Station, New York, New York, 10150. In the meantime, as an old friend used to say, Good night and good luck.